All right, listen up, cabbies. I got your assignments. Riga, 643. Wheeler, 148. Nardo, 804. And only you. You need to join host HP and Father Malone as they examine one of the greatest sitcoms in television history. Taxi. In Night Mr. Walters, a taxi podcast. Banta, zero, like your boxing record. Night Mr. Walters. Art lovers to Midnight Viewing, the Night Gallery podcast, where we discuss Night Gallery, Rod Serling's follow-up to the Twilight Zone. I'm Father Malone, and with me here in the gallery are the projection booths, Mike White. Ahoy, ahoy. And joining us, as always, is the culture cast, Chris Stashu. And I'm joined by my daughter, Jenny. Jenny, please say hi to everybody. Oh, Jenny, you're looking very lovely today. This is probably the most celebrated, talked about, written about, remembered episode of Night Gallery to its initial audience, syndicated as well, probably. It is season two, episode 22. It aired on March the 1st, 1972, and was split into two segments. Those are The Caterpillar and Little Girl Lost. There are horror stories and horror stories, elements of terror that take myriad forms. But this item has a built-in terror which can refrigerate even the most dispassionate amongst us. It has to do with a little beastie known as an earwig. A small bug that crawls into the human ear. And while inside, it doesn't whisper sweet nothings. It performs quite another function. Offered to you now on Night Gallery. A brand new nightmare which we call the Caterpillar. The Caterpillar was written by Rod Serling from a short story called Boomerang by Oscar Cook, which is a better title. And it was directed by Jean Zwark, who I think this might be his best direction of the entire series, maybe his career. This one stars Lawrence Harvey, Joanna Pettit. This is her third of four appearances on Night Gallery. Tom Helmore, John Williams. This is his second appearance. And Don Knight as a he's a professional english scumbag he was this guy was on every television show including banachek including colombo in swamp thing the traitorous prick that australian traitorous prick that's him but i mainly know him from abandoning three adorable children and then just when bill bixby and susan clark have them settled into a comfortable life he thinks he can swoop in and rip them away for what money how dare you separate the apple dumpling gang Anyway, this is a tale of jealousy in Borneo and a most elaborate and simple plan with which to woo a prospective mate. Mike, what'd you think of this one? Shouldn't it really be called the earwig? Can we? It that was really bothering me. No, of all the problems in the episode, that's the dumbest one. Like, why, <laughs> like B- boomerang is a perfect title for it. It mean it means just as much as a caterpillar because neither feature in the episode at all. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice if something, but yeah, I, I I must have either seen this or seen one of the countless adaptations of this story, or this feels like a, it's like a campfire tale, right? This whole thing yep. of, we took out the thing, but the thing laid babies. And I think I heard spider when I first heard the story. Okay, cool. But I thought it was well done. I really like Lawrence Harvey. I find it very funny because Chris, we're going to be talking about Lawrence Harvey again this week. So like Lawrence Harveying all over the place right now, which is great. Yeah. But it was just like a blackout skit that was stretched very long again, but better than most of these ones that we've talked about lately. They're going out on a high note. How about you, Chris? You know, Father Malone, you and I used to do a show about uh, Tales from the Crypt. And I think that this is in that wheelhouse there there are a couple episodes of that show that i can remember back i want to say one there's a woman 
with her head or she's a zombie and then there's a guy's head on a plate and they're in like Jamaica or something and it's a be careful what you wish for type thing where he's a, a jilted lover or something so I I'm I love it I love the bunch of oh, these stodgy British dickheads in Bonio. like I love that it's fantastic the setting is great I don't think they take too much advantage of it because it feels rather set bound unfortunately because it takes place inside of this plantation house with lawrence harvey just being horned up big time like an erection popping through his fucking pants like the moment he sees her and it's just like she to her credit she is like hell no joanna pettit is like hell no from moment one which is interesting because normally in these kinds of stories there's like this in the air, up in the airness about the female character's feelings towards the unrequited male love. And in this, she's like, go take a cold shower and ice your dick, bro. I wrote in my notes, finally, a love triangle story where there aren't two people who are wrong. Right. And I absolutely loved that aspect of this because this honestly, Father Blown, feels like the crescendo moment of having spent all those years watching Tales from the Crypt, and they just kept doing that shit over and over again. You have to have one of the people in the love triangle say no at some point, and it totally works here. It was very fresh. It was fresh, and the title is terrible. <laughs> yes, both things we can agree on. Oscar Cook, the author of the short story, apparently was in the military in Borneo, wrote a lot of stories that took place there, which is why it's set here. And, and, his, <clears throat> and himself said that this is a parable for rich white entitlement, The that Lawrence Harvey's character is just this wealthy guy who just wants what he wants, and he's going to take it no matter what. I, do I like that. Lawrence Harvey is one year away from death here. He has stomach cancer. He's in the throes of it here. And evidently, during the scenes when the earwig is eating his brain, did not take his pain medication for that day of filming. So what you're seeing is actual wow. genuine torment of Lawrence Harvey. That coupled with the makeup is fantastic here. If you look at his ear, you can see that the hair all around the area has been scratched off. You can see where the his nails have gouged at his own ears, thus necessitating his, him being tied to that bed. I thought that was really hard to watch and, and therefore really good. Also, he's wearing some fantastic button-up boots when we first meet him. They were beautiful. The music in this episode was handled by a new composer to Night Gallery. His name's Eddie Sauter. If you listen close in the background, it's, it's, there's an electric sitar and a marimba and these electronic squeaks. It's fantastic. Eddie Sauter used to be an arranger for Artie Shaw and Tommy Dorsey and the Benny Goodman Orchestra. And he will be providing the new theme for Night Gallery that we have with season three. In fact, Eddie Sauter will compose all of the music from here on out for Night Gallery. Wow, yeah, nice right. Job, I mentioned that I think this is Joark's best segment his best directed segment i agree chris this is a this is a bottle episode it is definitely a one location episode but i don't think it's set bound at all i think it's beautifully shot very uh, carefully lit and uh, and photographed there's a shot where there's a wooden scrim on the left side of the screen and lawrence harvey and and the husband's heads are both floating above it and joanna pettit steps into the frame on the right full frame so these two floating heads of these two characters who want her and then when Harvey has that super creepy line that his appetite is increasing while he's staring at her. The camera slides to the left. The yes. husband is now gone. It's now Joanna Pettit and Harvey in the frame together. And in the background of the, behind them are rifles and pistols. It's it's a beautiful shot. It's he's, He should have been nominated for an Emmy for this thing. The day after the earwig has been inserted into the wrong ear, or was it the right ear, everyone at breakfast is dressed like George Romero. They're all wearing their safari jackets. <laughs> it was so distracting for me because I know George Romero just kind of wore that as a uniform. but And I know that's exactly what everyone would be wearing in Borneo at this time period, but it was still a bit <laughs> unsettling. Okay, the Don Williams character. I said, was it the wrong ear or the right ear? Because do you think it's possible that character intentionally had the ear put, heard the earwig put into Lawrence Harvey's ear, like hearing his plan and what he was doing? It, it, I thought that for a little bit, but I'm not I wondered positive. that too. But that scene where he's like, 
oh, sorry, they they put it in the wrong air. It happens sometimes. Like, oh, oh fucking the most British guy around everybody. He had a fucking eel pie hanging out of his mouth for fuck's sake. I love that scene. Ain't you figured it out yet, mate? Ain't yeah. you figured it out? Oh, I am Britain. I am him. <laughs> like, I, but I, but there's like in that that scene shirks conventions too because I'm expecting him to show up at the window and be like, oh, you know, tough shit, asshole. But he's like, I'm sorry. So I don't know. I don't think. I think it was genuinely an accident, and he feels bad because that scene's like not to say it's moving, but. Couple that with Lawrence Harvey just going uh, and like making the noise is like you feel for both of the characters in the scene, which is not something I can mm-hmm. say for a lot of the segments in Night Gallery. So I kind of feel like it was an accident just based on that one scene alone. What's funny is I hadn't considered that it was intentionally put into Lawrence Harvey's ear until he comes up to apologize. And then I thought, oh, he's really contrite about this. Did he do this? And now he feels bad because he's seeing the results of it. I don't know. Maybe I was working overtime on this one, but at least the, uh, this particular segment begs these kind of questions and are conversations worth having. Also, you mentioned the lighting in some of the scenes, the scene where they're in the bar and it's the first time that Lawrence Harvey and Mr. Britton meet with his hat and it's lit really darkly, except for Lawrence Harvey's eyes. Yeah, that's and called it's, that's called a halo mm-hmm. eye light, which Jean yeah. Jean Zwark yeah. here like uses on Lawrence Harvey at every opportunity. And why wouldn't you? Lawrence Harvey's oh, face yeah. is look. I know he's sick here, but what a face, man! He always had that so those cheekbones and that gaunt, stony kind of stare. He that this is a guy who too often, in my opinion, got cast as a hero in movies, and that's what kept him from getting further. I think because if you cast him as a villain, he's fucking aces man just like you see him here that's why he was perfect in the manchurian candidate because you didn't know is he this or is he bad like everybody's fawning over him but you know something's not right i love his eyebrow raises it's the eyebrow raises i mean it's his eye line really it's that t-zone area but those eyebrows man he's like he can do like a john philip law eyebrow raise like he he would be the american Diabolic. That's exact. You know? I could not put my finger on who he was reminding me of, but yes, John Philip Law. Holy Lord. Here's a, here's a fun fact that ruins the entire episode. There are no pain receptors in the brain. But other than that, I really, really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fact. I, this is an episode I knew about long before I had ever seen it because Stephen King chronicles it in his book, Dance Macabre, his, his fiction book of horror from oh. 1979 or so, where he kind of... That's yeah, he kind of lays into from. the series as not being anything uh, very good, but he singles this particular episode out as achieving th- the highest level of horror that he thought the series would ever get to. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I would agree. I, I'm, well, we haven't seen the rest of the season so or the series, so that doesn't bode well. But uh, get the master of horror. There's so many books and half-price books with Ks on them that are just Stephen King and no other horror writer, so he must be right. <laughs> I hope not, but at the same time, I mean, this is, I guess this is scary. I don't know. I don't, to sit and think about the ending, is the ending of this a scary ending? He's just going to die. That's it. Like, he's just going to, his head's going to explode and he's going to die. Oh, is that all? We watched him with one in his ear, writhing and not being able to vocalize at all from the horrendous amount of pain he was enduring. And now he's going to have at least a dozen or so more of them in there. Yeah, and they'll kill him, right? The only ending for him is a pistol, right? Just take it off of the wall. That'd be too good for you, mate. You'll have to sit and endure the pain. Here's what I really liked. He goes through this entire ordeal. It's a miracle John Williams shows up to tell us that the ear would came out the other ear. And then Lawrence Harvey immediately reverts to being a cocksucker in the face of miracle. <laughs> yes. Oh. So in this case, this comeuppance is absolutely genuinely earned. You're going to have me yeah. arrested at the yeah, dock, aren't you? <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah. Yeah, there were some good bits to this, definitely. But like I said, it just felt a little long. I guess it was those writhing and pain scenes. Like, it felt like it just went on for a Uh, long time. 
if you've watched the recent one, this is probably the one off of the DVD that the episode is 33 minutes, but that's technically like a director's cut because when it was originally aired, I think like six minutes were cut out of it. So we definitely got to see the full Mm -hmm. length version. Maybe had we seen the original and what ended up on syndication version, like a lot of, a lot of our problems might've gone away with the episode. Our next painting on night gallery tells the story of an illusion, an invisible specter, which guides and motivates and drives. And though you will never see her, this childish wraith, you'll know she's there. And we venture to suggest that you'll be chilled by the knowledge. Our painting is called Little Girl Lost. Little Girl Lost. This was written by Stanford Whitmore based on a short story by Richard Matheson. Oh, no, that was the Twilight Zone, Little Girl Lost. Right. This one was written by uh, a short story written by author E.C. Tubb. Uh, it was directed by Timothy Galfus, stars Tim Riley himself, Mr. William Wyndham, Ed Nelson, Ivor Francis, Ivor Francis. And uh, the painting, which is a beautiful painting at the beginning of this ethereal, ghostly, small girl floating in uh, negative space. That's Chanel Wright, Tom Wright's daughter. She's the model for that one. She was also the model for The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes. Gee, I don't even have, really have a description of this story. This is a, you guys want to describe this one? <laughs> well, it's very appropriate that we started with the boy who predicted earthquakes this season and ending with this one. It really feels, if I didn't know better, it feels like they had a plan and that these were the perfect bookends for this whole season. But can I describe the plot? No, I really cannot tell you what, the central stuff was hinging on chris i know you said you watched these three times each what the hell's going on with this okay so we have a scientific genius who is being tasked with developing fission or fusion i guess fission right and his daughter dies and so the guy starts losing it because he is imagining his daughter and another scientist is sent in to be a confederate as it were and say oh i see her she's here and that's why i did the whole intro the way i did it was like hey jenny's here because that's the girl's name in the segment and then it (laughs) turns i could just say what happens and then it turns out that he is telling them the wrong thing intentionally because he wants to literally fucking destroy the world so that he can die and maybe not the world, but himself at least and a sizable portion of people around him so that he can die and go be with his daughter and his wife who he knew weren't actually there. And he did this all on purpose because he felt guilty and he was stalling to come up with a way to make it intentionally bad. Wait, that was that what it? I- <laughs> okay wow that was the way i read it okay here's my synopsis of the story a scientist is working on what could potentially be a doomsday device and has gotten so close to the formula that the military are champing at the bit to get it his daughter dies he has a psychotic break he still sees his daughter and will not deal with the military at all so they send in this psychiatrist guy to convince him that he should go back to work and finish the formula and that he'll take care of the daughter and and then that he does finish it and he figures out the formula is a doomsday thing that if they use it at all it's going to kill everything and that snaps him back to reality and then and then the world ends that's what i thought happened oh huh. mike what do you think happened let's just make us a rondelay a triptych of synopses I, like i said i really wasn't catching what they needed him for for some reason i just went in one ear and out the other like an earwig or caterpillar Ah, I'm still so mad about that. I just knew that they had to humor this guy and he was going to give them something at the end. So then when the world blew up, I was like, oh, is that what they wanted? That's probably not what they wanted. (laughs) But just the whole pantomiming of taking care of little Jenny. Oh, my God, that gets old very fast. And especially I wanted the one scientist who can see Harvey, I wanted him to be like, no, Harvey's not there. Harvey's sitting over there. <laughs> That's what I wanted him to, to fuck with the other guy. But the other guy just picked up and went with it. Oh, what a lovely red dress you have. And I wanted the other guy to be like, red, That's green. It really has that nice cabin in the woods ending to it where we start panning up and something just destroys everything. And they're, oh my God, no. Yeah, I wanted a giant rabbit no. foot to squish them. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's just it's I don't know. Like it's a gag that goes on and on and on and on. At least it's not 40 minutes, I guess. This one is 17 minutes. Right. Yeah. And it is filled with cinematic pet peeves of mine, like the missing rear view mirror in the car when they're driving together. I fucking hate that. Just come on. Do a little extra work. Another was the constant brushing of the girls of the little girl's hair. Like I know oh my God. it's to establish the physical presence of the girl. Like we get it, but that big old chunky brush and how fucking long is that girl's hair anyway? Stop brushing her hair. That's another thing. That's another pet peeve. Like the over attentive dad in movies who's constantly brushing the girl's hair as if that's somehow making up for the lack of their mom or something. I don't know. It always bothers me. This is a, th- like the segment had the opportunity to do something interesting and it attempted it i guess but it just again it reminds me of the segment that we were just talking about the the one with the robots like the ending just oh yeah the ending is like f- absolutely insane it makes very little to no sense and i'm not saying the segment is good in spite of i'm not saying that the ending ruins the segment but it doesn't help it let's just put it that way no, there, it's a mashup, it feels like. It's yeah. either about this man, this crazy man and his potential ghost daughter or something or something to do with that, or it's about this guy who figured out a formula for the end of the world and has gone insane. Like, they, they don't show us what the psychotic break, I guess the daughter dying was the psychotic break to begin with, but is the moment where he snaps back to reality when that guy is rude to him at the restaurant, he wants the chair because there's no one sitting at the table? That's what it felt like. Right. Yeah, that's kind of what it felt like to me, too. And I was like, why that? Why was that the thing? Like, has this just never happened before? And it had to have. He's been out in public with his daughter for how long? Like, you know, right. Why didn't they buy? At one point, the attendant says, oh, let's go buy her a doll. He's trying to stall William Wyndham when he knows that he's getting suicidal and such. And that's a scenario that I wanted to see play out, like going to the toy store, picking out the doll, taking it out of the package, holding it out to the air and just dropping it to the ground. <laughs> like, right. Like it's one thing yeah. to have the brush in your hand, but like, how real is she? If you like, let's go buy her that doll. Does she want a lollipop? Here you go. Crack. I, yeah, I feel like they should have done that. Right. Like, I feel like they should have gone all the way. Cause like the gag with the brush is just overdone. Like at some point, you're just like, can you do anything else other than brush her hair? Yeah, it didn't it, like read to her or something. Just do any other right. sort of activity that doesn't involve her hair. It's sort of weird. <laughs> yeah, it was very disturbing. And that's how they introduce it. And they, they just keep doing it. Which, yeah, like, again, if that's if that factors into the story somehow, but it doesn't even factor into the story, it doesn't serve a purpose at all. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I don't. Again, it goes back to this idea in my mind of the show just does the same thing a couple times too many. Mm-hmm. And there you and I do appreciate the circularity with Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes being the first segment of this season and this one being the last. If that's the story they were telling, it just feels like they went, hey, you know, it'd be cool if we ended this one just like we ended the first one of this season. Mm-hmm. Just put it on there. Like every episode ends the same way with the world <laughs> blowing up. No matter what episode it is, it's just that's what happens. Season three is all Armageddon. This season was all revenge. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, we're missing an opportunity here to mention our one of our favorite segments ever from Night Gallery. The last time we saw William Wyndham. Oh yeah. They're no. tearing down Tim Riley's Barbie. Yeah, Father, that's how Father Malone introduced them. Yeah, and we somehow have slipped under the for he's a jolly good fellow radar once Ooh, again. Shoo. Boy, doesn't it feel good? Sure does. We made it through the whole season. There, there's no way we can have any in the next season, right? Unless William Wyndham returns. William Wyndham returns in, Thursday, in the third season. Oh, oh no. no. God, we're going to have to bring it up one more time. I'm pretty sure we're going to get one more, honestly. I, I'm hoping you're talking about the new music for season three. I'm hoping it's a play in for he's a. That, oh, wouldn't that be great if that was the opening titles now? <laughs> God. And they did it enough in their tearing down Tim Riley's bar. They did it enough times there. God. And that wasn't their tearing down Tim Riley's bar. Wasn't that a 40 minute long segment or something? Yep. Like it was 
Oh, dear God. I There's a weird really circularity Wyndham. here now in that that was the last season ender, and this is this season ender. Both have William Wyndham, but this one's 17 Damn minutes man. as opposed to that 40-minute slog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a breezy comparatively. <laughs> and no, I, he's a jelly good fellow. Yeah. I honest to God thought that was Twilight Zone 1985. That's how long ago that feels like when we did They're Tearing Down Tim Riley's Bar. That like because that was the I mean that was like you mentioned that was the end of the last season so it's been an entire season since we saw. Well, it's good that we've put the trauma that far behind us. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Prepare for season three. I, exactly. We're gonna play a preview for our next episode, and we'll be right back to wrap things up. On display here is a painting showing the natural habitat of this species of black-eyed practitioner: dark alley, murky light, a few sundry skulls. And the gentleman himself on the right of the picture, with the upraised hand and the funny little goat horns. Yes, indeed, this is a sorcerer. And for those of you who disbelieve his existence, we invite you to check this out for a little while. Our painting is called The Return of the Sorcerer. And where a better place for him to return than right here in the night gallery. Our number one painting in tonight's exhibit, this intriguing portrait of a young lady, curiously photogenic and hauntingly familiar. Recall seeing this face? You've seen it. On billboards and magazine ads, on television commercials. Oh yes, you've seen it. But there are people who, having seen it, wish they hadn't. Our painting is called The Girl with the Hungry Eyes. And should I have failed to mention it, this is the Night Gallery. That's right. On the next Midnight Viewing, we're taking a look at Season 3, Episode 1 and Episode 2. Those are The Return of the Sorcerer and one of my favorite titles of all time, The Girl with the Hungry Eyes. Who can it be? It's Joanna Pettit again. Midnight Viewing is a proud member of the Weirding Way Media Group. Our theme song was composed by HP. Until next time, what are you working on, Chris Stashu? podcast weirdingwaymedia.com but don't just listen to my show listen to noise junkies which father malone hosts with the aforementioned hp and mondo heather's heather drain or uh, 80s tv ladies hosted by one of the hosts of rankin on bass richard haddam his wife and her co-host talk all about you guessed it 80s tv shows featuring who ladies <laughs> check their show out check all those shows out weirdingwaymedia.com folks you really laid you, that out. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You know what they say? You got to lay the red carpet on thick so that people have something nice to walk on. What about you, Mike? Me? Oh, not a whole lot. You know, just been kind of hanging around and stuff and working on the Projection Booth podcast. New episodes every week. Sometimes many. This is going to be a thing for a little while. A lot of bonus episodes. So go on and check those out. Had a nice interview with Mr. Eddie Deason today. So that was that was fun. It was a lot of fun to talk with Eddie. Check all, it out. Well, listen to all the archives over there at the Projection Booth Podcast. As for me, you want to see some of my nonsense, go to fathermalone.com. If you want to hear all of my nonsense, go to weirdingwaymedia.com. Thank you all for joining us here at Midnight Viewing. The gallery is now closed. <laughs>